Hi, welcome back for AP Physics One Review. This is Brian Brown, again, still from beautiful central New Jersey. Um, and today we're going to be reviewing Unit 3, Circular Motion and Gravitation. So we're still in the study of dynamics, but now we're analyzing a different type of motion than the ones that we've previously discussed. We're gonna take a more detailed look into the force of gravity. I know we mentioned that in the last unit, but there's a few more details we wanna cover. So the key concepts that we're gonna to introduce today are centripetal acceleration and Newton's law of gravitation. Let's get started. In this session, we're going to take a look at circular motion and gravitation, again, through the same lenses that we've looked at the other concepts. What are the important terms and definitions? What are the relevant equations? Which ones are on the AP Physics One equation sheet? What are the relevant graphs? And when you can apply these concepts and when you can't apply them. We'll also take a look at practice questions, both from uh, multiple choice type questions and different types of free response questions. So let's review these concepts. Circular motion. Let's go back a second. I already mentioned the word acceleration a few times. So what does acceleration measure? You said how fast an object's velocity changes, then you were paying attention in the first unit. Another way of saying how fast an object's velocity changes, more formal definition, is that acceleration is the rate at which an object's velocity changes. We use the word rate a lot. Velocity is the rate that an object's position changes. So velocity can change in three ways. We've talked about two of them so far. An object can speed up, an object can slow down, and this third one we're gonna focus on today, an object can change direction. Most people don't always consider changing direction and acceleration, but it turns out that circular motion does deal with the acceleration involved with changing the direction of an object's velocity. Remember, velocity includes direction, speed doesn't. A special case of circular motion is if the speed doesn't change and the object uh, you know, just travels in a circular path. It doesn't even need to be a full circle, just any circular path. But if the speed doesn't change, we call that a uniform circular motion. Most of the examples that we deal with are uniform circular motion types. So the first thing I wanna look at are the directions of all the vectors involved with circular motion. So let's take our object, a simple blue object, and it's traveling in a circular path. Uh, PowerPoint changes the speed a little bit, but pretend it kept a constant speed throughout. And let's take a look at the object in the far right side of the circular path. The velocity is tangent to the path. So if it's going in a counterclockwise direction, the velocity at the far right is going upwards. In a short period of time later, the second velocity will have changed its direction. Same speed, different direction. So now we have to define the acceleration direction. It's got to be perpendicular to the velocity at any point because if the acceleration were with the velocity direction, it would increase the speed. And if the acceleration opposed the direction of the velocity, it would decrease the speed. So the only option left is that it's perpendicular, right? The acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity. So at the far right side of the path, the acceleration is going inwards. That kind of makes sense because this object at that point is turning to the left. So the acceleration is directed to the left. At any point along the path, the acceleration is always pointing to the center of the circle. Again, this way it can keep changing the direction 
And this acceleration is called centripetal acceleration. Since acceleration and net force are always in the same direction, the net force is pointed to the center of the circle. I, a lot of people talk about centripetal force at this point. I don't like using that term. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit more. Let's just consider it the net force. Centripetal acceleration is proportional to the square of the speed of the object and inversely proportional to the radius of the circular path. So the equation, which is on the equation sheet, says AC, right? The centripetal acceleration is d squared over r. The net force, as we talked about in unit two, can consist of many different forces, right? The typical forces that we've described so far are gravity, tension, normal force, friction, and spring forces. They could provide the net force, or you might have components of these forces, or you could have combinations of these forces or their components. How do we decide what the net force is? Well, we can determine that after we draw a free body diagram for our situation. Again, let me point out that a lot of people refer to the net force as centripetal force in this case, but that kind of introduces a new type of force, which we never really need to talk about. I usually just consider centripetal force to be the net force that causes centripetal acceleration. So let's take a look at an example. A yo-yo going around in a, a vertical circle at a constant speed, um, and in this case, it's going counterclockwise. We're gonna try to find the tension in the string when the yo-yo is at the top of its path. So we've attacked this problem the same way we've attacked problems dealing with forces in the last unit. Let's draw a free body diagram. We know that the centripetal acceleration is downwards because it's towards the center of the circle. So we know that there's going to be a net force downwards as well at this point. So let's take a look at our free body diagram. What forces act on the yo-yo at the top of its path? Well, we know we have tension, right? The string is pulling it down and we have the gravitational force pulling the yo-yo down as well. A lot of people get concerned at this picture and they say, well, what, what's the upwards force? There doesn't need to be an upwards force, right? There's, this is not a balanced situation. So I wouldn't necessarily need an upwards force. Um, so, you know, again, at this point, take a look at your free body diagram. Do, do the forces allow you to have a net force in the direction you're concerned about? And they do. So we're ready to apply Newton's second law. Right, F net equals the mass times acceleration of the object at this point. And in this case, we know it's a centripetal acceleration. So I just made a little change to my Newton's second law equation. I know that net force is equal to M times V squared over R since that's a centripetal acceleration. And from my free body diagram, I see that both the tension and gravity act downwards so I can sum those and set those equal to mv squared over r. Rearranging this to find the tension, I can see that the tension is really mv squared over r minus mg at this point. At the top of the vertical loop, we see that the tension is less than mv squared over r by the weight. There is a special case to the velocity at the top of the loop. To maintain a circular path, there needs to be at least, the, the tension needs to be at least zero. So if we set the tension equal to zero in that equation and solve for the velocity, we find out that the minimum velocity this yo-yo needs to complete its circular path is the square root of rg. It's not just zero. If it were zero or less than the square root of rg, it would not travel in a circular path. It might be a projectile at that point. 
let's take a look at a slightly different location. Let's look at the bottom of the path and see how that compares to the tension at the top of the path. Again, we know the answer in terms of the acceleration and net force. We know they're both upwards at the bottom of the path. But there's more that changes than just the direction of the net force. The free body diagram is very different. The tension in this case is going upwards and the force of gravity is downwards. Again, I notice a lot of students draw the tension to be equal to the force of gravity, but that's only if it's a balanced situation. In this case, we know it's not balanced. There has to be a net force that's upwards. So we can apply Newton's second law and decide that the net force, again, is the mass times the centripetal acceleration. But in this case, it's the difference between the tension and the force of gravity, which yield the net force. So solving for the tension, we know that the tension is the sum of mg and mv squared over r. The tension is going to be greater at the bottom of this vertical circle than it is at the top if it has a constant speed everywhere. OK, let's take a look at a couple more terms that come along with uniform circular motion. These aren't really major physics terms, but they do get used a lot in describing these situations. So the period, that's the time for one revolution. We abbreviate with a capital T, and it's measured in seconds. The frequency, lowercase f, is the number of revolutions per second, and its unit is hertz. Let's do a quick example just to see the relationship here. Let's say a fan turns and makes 30 turns in 15 seconds. We can find the period as the 15 seconds divided by 30 turns, or 0.5 seconds. Or the frequency is just the reverse, right? It's 30 turns divided by 15 seconds, so you get two seconds. We see that period and frequency are reciprocals of each other. So that's a nice relationship to remember. The reason I introduced this is to get to a, a slightly different equation, which talks about the speed, which again, we're going to need that if we're going to find the centripetal acceleration, because the speed is the, the magnitude of the velocity. And in general, speed is distance over time. But for circular orbits, this distance that uh, an object will travel is the circumference, or 2 pi r. And the time is the period, because we only want the time for one revolution. So we see that the speed is 2 pi r divided by the period, or we can say 2 pi r times the frequency. The reason I bring these up is that these are not on the AP equation sheet. It's a very quick derivation, but you need to remember that relationship. And, and if you don't remember the equation, remember how we got there, distance over time. OK, so now let's take a closer look at the force of gravity, basically Newton's law of gravitation. We've, we've looked at so far if an object is near the surface of the Earth. We've used this equation, the force of gravity equals m times g, right? because at the surface of the Earth, or near the surface, the acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. What happens uh, to that? acceleration of gravity as an object moves farther from the Earth. Well, if I move the object out to this location, you might imagine that there's less gravitational attraction. It doesn't go down to zero, but it's smaller. And we're going to take a look at how to find g at this location. We can go back and take a look at the definition of G itself, right? G is the gravitational field or the acceleration of gravity. And usually we get that by looking at the force of gravity divided by the mass. So we need another way of figuring out the force of gravity on an object when it's not at the surface of the Earth. Well, Newton helped us out with this. The idea that Newton said behind a, a 
universal force of gravity is that any two objects have a force of gravity on each other. Remember, all forces are interactions between two objects. So when we talked about the force of gravity so far, we meant the force of the Earth on some other object. But it really applies to any two objects. And what does it depend on? Well, we know, first of all, this force is always attractive. And it depends on each of the masses of the objects. So it's directly related to the mass of each object. And it also depends on the distance that they are apart. The distance isn't just the separation between the two surfaces. The distance is the center to center distance. And the force of gravity is inversely related to the square of the center to center distance. And for a short term, we just call it the inverse square rule. So the magnitude of the force of gravity is g, this not the little g, but it's big G, a universal gravitational constant, times the two masses divided by that separation distance squared. Remember, that big G is not 9.8. It's far from it. It's actually a very small number, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. You don't need to memorize that. It's on the equation sheet. You need to remember, though, that any two objects always have this gravitational interaction with each other. The Earth doesn't have to be one of these objects. So let's take a, a look at another way of combining these two equations that we know for the force of gravity. We know that G is defined to be a force of gravity divided by the mass of the object placed there. So we're looking to figure out the gravitational field of this large mass M at some location R away. So again, we can go to the definition. This gravitational field equals the force of gravity divided by the little mass that we place at this location in the field. But we also know that that force of gravity is big G times M, the, the two masses, divided by the distance squared. So when I divide that by the test mass that's out there, the test mass cancels out. This equation is not on the equation sheet, but it's one, again, it's a very quick derivation and it's, it's an important one to apply. So the gravitational field of any large object is equal to G times the mass of that object divided by R squared. Again, any object will experience a force of mg, a gravitational force of mg, when it's in some gravitational field. You just you have to figure out what g is if you're not near or on the surface of the Earth. Another nice thing to notice is when you're close to the surface of any planet, the center to center distance is really the radius of the planet. So this equation gets a little bit more simplified um, in terms of the mass of the planet divided by the radius of the planet, as long as you're on or close to the surface of any planet. So now you can go ahead and figure out the gravitational field of Venus or Mars or the moon, as long as you know the mass of that planet and the radius of the planet. You don't have to memorize any of those values. They'll be given to you. All right, let's take another look at this inverse square relationship. This is the first time in physics that it's come up, but it turns out that this is a, a relationship that comes up between many factors in physics as we move along. So I wanna take just an extra look at this. If you're at the surface of the earth, we know that you're gonna have a maximum gravitational force on you. And as you move further away, that force drops. It turns out that force drops pretty quickly because it's an inverse square relationship. So if I go from R to 2R, I double the distance, the force doesn't just decrease by half. 
it decreases by two squared, which is four. So we see that if the acceleration of gravity at the surface of the Earth is about 10, then the acceleration at twice the distance from the Earth's center is 10 divided by four, or two squared, right? So that's 2.5. And so it's, it's a quick drop from 10 to 2.5. And as you continue, let's say you continue out to five times the radius of the planet, then the, the, the gravitational field of that planet will have decreased not five times, not even 10 times, right? It's five squared, which is 25 times. So it'd be 10 divided by 25, which is 0.4. It's putting you pretty, pretty small pretty small uh, gravitational field. And we can see that for any number that we plug in, it gets, you know, any large number, this gravitational field gets smaller, but it never gets to zero. So let's practice this from another perspective. We've seen the equation, but oftentimes these are symbolic type questions where you don't even need to use the constant of g. So let's take a look at, at this first multiple choice question. I've switched it up a little bit and chosen a, a sample problem with three objects. So the first instinct I, I, I see from most students is, wait a second, we don't have an equation for the force of gravity of three objects. You've only mentioned what the force of gravity is for two objects. That's true. There is no equation for three objects. We have to do this problem a few different um, a few different times. So we have to figure out the gravitational interaction between 2m and m. So I'm going to write an expression for this. I don't have to solve it numerically. I just have to write out the expression at first. So the <clears throat> gravitational force between those two objects is the constant times the two masses, which are 2m and m, divided by r squared. So I know that that, according to this problem, the two smaller spheres have an interaction of 50. So whatever those m's and r's are, when I take a look at that expression, it's going to equal 50. We'll keep that in mind for later. I now have to find, since I'm dealing with the net gravitational force on the small sphere, the force that the large sphere has on the small sphere. So that large force is big G times the two masses, in this case, 24M and M, divided by that distance squared. Be careful, it's 2R, but that whole thing has to be squared, not just two times just R squared. And then I'll simplify that, just pull the numbers out in front, 24 divided by four, I know is six. And you'll see the second part of the expression is the same as the second part of the expression that I had in the first example. So it seems like I don't have a lot of information, but I do know that since it's three times greater in the second case, um, based on this expression, that I know that the gravitational force has to be three times greater. So it's 150 Newtons uh, of force. Now I kind of have to draw a free body diagram because I need to know the net force on the smallest sphere. So I need to draw the directions of each of those forces. I know that there's 150 Newtons acting to the right because it's an attractive force and 50 Newtons acting to the left because the other force is attractive, but in the other direction. So even though they're both attractive, I'm not going to add these forces I'm going to take the difference of these forces because they're in opposite directions. So the net force is 100 Newtons. You'll notice that each of the options has a number that comes about someplace along the problem. And maybe if I added those forces, I would have chosen this last option. But the correct option is 100 Newtons. Again. There's lots of problems for the force of gravity where you don't need to plug in 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th or the masses or the radius. You're just looking for what changes in the situation and comparing some original situation to some change situation. So you can look at this in terms of ratios.
Okay, let's switch over to a free response question, different representations. This one I'll get uh, involves circular motion. So let's say you're, you're spinning something over your head. Uh, the string has a length of L and there's an angle theta between the string and a vertical. Okay, and the object has a mass M. What are the forces that act on object M? Well, we know that there's a gravitational force going downwards. We know that there's a tension going upwards. And really, that's got to be it. Those are the only two forces. Going back to the key questions of the force unit previously, the, the question is, what direction is the acceleration? That always kind of gives away the answer. And since this object, object is accelerating in a circle, I know that the acceleration is inwards, which in this case, we're looking at this circle. It's not in the direction of the string. The center of the circle is a, it's a horizontal circle, so it's straight to the, the center of the circle. So I know that the acceleration is straight to the right at this point. The net force also has to be straight to the right. Okay, so the question really asks about um, wh why the string can't be completely horizontal at this for, for this type of motion. And the answer is, I know that the acceleration is to the right, so the net force is to the right, but I have a downwards force of the force of gravity. So the tension has to have a component that acts upwards because vertically the forces are balanced. It's only horizontally that I have a net force. So no matter how fast you spin this, you can't get the string to be completely horizontal. Now, if you spin it fast enough, it may look horizontal, but there's always a small angle. Again, if I look at the, the tension force, there's two components to the tension, the horizontal and the vertical. The vertical's got to balance the force of gravity. I know that this free response question has a lot of parts, and so that those components are going to come in handy as we start to go a little bit further in this problem, like derive the equation that relates the speed and the angle. So I can go back to exactly what I've drawn so far and take a look at these components a little bit more and um, use Newton's second law and see what other relationships I can gather from this. One thing I know is this is a little different. The angle, in many problems, it's given with a horizontal. But in this case, the angle between the tension is, is given from a vertical reference. So it kind of switches the components a little bit in terms of what trig functions you may use. The x component is the ft sine of the angle, and the y component is ft cosine of the angle. So we're going to need those terms. I also know, as we mentioned, that the vertical forces are balanced. So ft cosine theta has to equal mg. The horizontal forces are not balanced. There's only one horizontal force. It couldn't be balanced anyway. But I know that that has to be the net force. So ft sine theta has to equal mv squared over r. Looks like there's a you know there's too many unknowns, but one thing you can do to simplify this expression is divide these two equations. And I chose to divide ft sine theta by ft cosine theta because the sine over the cosine gives me the tangent. And we'll notice that the, the tension forces cancel out and the masses cancel out. So the tangent of the angle is simply v squared over rg. Now I have to go a little bit further because if I rearrange this and solve for the velocity at this point, it would still have r in the expression. But go back to the original question. It asks in terms of l, not in terms of r. So I've got to get rid of 
r as a, a variable. But we can go back to the original picture in terms of dimensions. This isn't a free body diagram. It's just helping us with the dimensions of this picture. So r um, is the opposite side of theta, and L is the hypotenuse. So we know that R is just L sine theta. So after I make that substitution in for R, I can see that I have a pretty big expression, but I can figure out what the velocity is in terms of L and theta and G. I don't have to worry about simplifying these two trig functions. Again, this is a free response question. so. It's worth, there, there are many points um, in terms of this particular part of the problem. So even if you didn't get the exact right answer at the end, you can get points for making these good statements of using Newton's second law in each direction and trying to use the components as best you can. Again, just try to collect as many points as you can by giving information that helps you move through this problem. Let's go to a second question. The second question I, I threw in because it looks like a very different situation. It's a, an object spinning around. Again, it's a horizontal circle, but it's in a cone. And actually the second question gives two different situations. It gives one when the block is released from rest and slides down the surface of the cone. And it gives a second when the block is moving forwards with a certain velocity and maintains the horizontal circle. So let's take a look at that first situation in, in the beginning. In block one, is the block accelerating? I'm sorry, in case one, is the block accelerating? So if I just release this from rest, is it accelerating? And I think you can see that, you can imagine that, yeah, it's like a, a block on an incline, it's just accelerating along the surface of the incline. Right. How can you determine the direction of the acceleration? Well, we know that it's starting at rest and it's getting faster and faster in that direction. So the object is accelerating towards the tip of the cone. Let's take a look at the second case. If the object is given a velocity and, main and maintains that speed, as it goes around the circle, is the object accelerating? You said, no, go back to the definitions that we talked about in the beginning. The object is definitely accelerating because it's changing its direction as it moves in this horizontal circle. Two very different types of acceleration. Okay, so this is a nice problem because we can compare these two situations and take a look at how to solve for the acceleration in each case. They both have the same force, this gravitational force going downwards. And in both situations, there's a normal force. The cone is, surface is pushing the object perpendicular away from the surface. So in each case, there's, an, there's a normal force. But before you draw the normal force in, remember, you know the answer in terms of the acceleration. In the first case, the object's accelerating along the surface. So when I draw the normal force, I know that there needs to be a net force going down the ramp. And we'll, we'll take a look at that one in a second. In the second case, I know the acceleration is inwards. So I know that I have to make this normal force a little larger so that the acceleration, the net force can be inwards, straight to the right. How can I justify that in terms of components? Well, in the second case, I look at my normal force and break it into horizontal and vertical components because the acceleration is horizontal. Okay, so again, in these, two different cases, the acceleration's in different directions. We talked about case two, how the acceleration is horizontal, but in case one, the acceleration is along the surface of the ramp. So I'm not gonna choose a horizontal and vertical uh, reference frame. I'm gonna choose a coordinate system where 
one of the axes is parallel to the surface and the other is perpendicular. If I do that, I see that the gravitational force is resolved into two components. The angle that the cone made with the horizontal was theta. You can take a look at the geometry and show that the theta will turn out, the same theta will be in the, um, the angle between the gravitational force and the perpendicular component. So the parallel component of the gravitational force is mg sine theta, and the perpendicular component is mg cosine theta. If I start to apply Newton's second law, I know that the, the forces in the perpendicular direction have to balance each other. So the normal force isn't equal to the weight of the object. The normal force only has to be equal to the component of the weight, which is in the perpendicular direction. So it's mg cosine theta. I can go ahead and finish this um, problem in terms of finding the acceleration because the net force I know is in the parallel direction that has to equal mass times acceleration. And since the net force is just the parallel component of gravity, it's mg sine theta. So setting that equal to ma, I see that the, uh, the mass uh, doesn't matter in terms of the acceleration in this case. So the acceleration is just g sine theta. It's always nice to do a reality check, a gut check for this equation. The sine of theta ranges from zero to one. If the angle is zero, which means that the angle that the ramp makes, the cone makes is zero, it's a flat ramp horizontally, the sine of zero is zero. So that makes sense because there is no component of gravity helping drive the object down the ramp. If the ramp increases to a 90 degree angle, now the object's just falling vertically and the sine of 90 is one. So the acceleration we expect to be about 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's a nice reality check that this equation makes sense. In our second case, well, I think we can do this one quickly because this free body diagram looks very familiar. If you think back to the tension in the string problem, it's the same free body diagram with the same angle location. And so we already know the result. The tangent of theta has to equal b squared over rg. It's the same derivation. And that's a nice thing to, to note, right? When we look at tensions and normal forces, oftentimes they're interchangeable. Tensions pull an object, normal forces push, but in many problems, one can substitute for another. Let's take a look at a, another representation. Um, so this one, we'll go back to the force, universal force of gravity, and we'll take a look at it as the gravitational force applies for, uh, from, uh, between Jupiter and um, moons of Jupiter. So let's take a look at the, we're given some data in terms of the period that different moons of Jupiter have and the distance, center to center distance are. Oftentimes, uh, in, in circular motion, that R from circular motion is the same R is in the universal gravitational force equation because both of them measure that center to center distance. So you're given the data, and then the first thing you're asked to do is to create an expression for the gravitational force between Jupiter and one of its moons. Well, again, we can't use Fg equals Mg because we don't know the gravitational field of Jupiter off the top of our heads at some location r. So we're going to need to write it out using the general form of the law of gravity. We know, we know the two masses involved are the mass of Jupiter and the mass of the moon. So I'm going to substitute those subscripts in our, our starting equation. And, and that's it. We're done. This it was not a big derivation to figure out the force of gravity between Jupiter and one of its moons.
we're going to use that expression to derive a relationship between the period as a function of the orbital radius. This one turns into a bit of alphabet soup. We've got to take a look at the motion of the moon, right? The moon's not stationary there. If it were, it wouldn't be stationary for long. It would accelerate towards Jupiter at this point and go in a straight line and crash into Jupiter. Fortunately, that moon has a velocity, tangential velocity, so that it will maintain a circular orbit. Don't be misled, it's still falling towards Jupiter, but it's falling to keep a circular path. Right? If it weren't falling towards Jupiter, in other words, if there was no acceleration, the velocity of the moon would just continue going a straight line and eventually it would get farther and farther away from Jupiter. Okay, so we know that there's an acceleration, we know that there's a net force, and we know that that net force on the moon is the force of gravity. Whenever we use Newton's second law, that ma term is the mass of the object that's accelerating that, we're, that we've drawn the free body diagram of. So this is the mass of the moon on the side, not the mass of Jupiter. Again, we see that the mass of the moon doesn't affect this expression, cancels out. So the velocity for something in orbit is just the square root of g mass of the planet divided by r. That's a nice expression to know. Now we go back to this other expression, which I said, yeah, you don't have to, it's not, you, you don't have to derive it, but you should remember it because it's not on the equation sheet, right? The velocity is two pi r over the period. So here's where it gets into a little bit of alphabet soup, right? This V is really squared in the equation on the right. So I've got to square this term. So four pi squared R squared over T squared, that's V squared equals this GMJ over R. Now I've got a relationship that has all the variables I want in it, right? I wanted the period as a function of the orbital radius R it's actually part of Kepler's third law. But again, it's a quick derivation. Okay, let's take a look at another skill that you'll need to show that you know in terms of the AP exam. This question talks about linearization. What quantity should be graphed to yield a straight line whose slope can be used to determine the mass of Jupiter? Well, we were kind of walked through this. We know that t squared really is a function of r cubed. So when they asked us to figure out what t squared and r cubed were, they did that for a reason. It's because graphing those two terms will help create a line. And the reason that we, we see that is that normally a line as a form y equals the slope times x. I didn't use m because m in physics is mass. So I just wrote out the word slope, right? y equals the slope times x. So here, y is really t squared. The shaded part is the slope and r cubed is the x axis. So when I plot those points that I've uh, calculated, I do get a straight line. I can draw my best fit line. It should be a good approximation of, of where all the points lie. And then I'm asked to find the slope. When you find the slope, do not use data points. That's an automatic deduction of a point. You really want to pick two points that aren't data points, kind of far away from each other that will help reduce error a bit and choose some, uh, some that are easy to read. I'm not sure if it goes through zero, zero. It looks like my graph is a little off that. So I chose two other points that look like they are easy for me to interpolate. Again, I know that that slope from before is that shaded part that's the four pi squared over gmj. So I know that in order to solve for mj, 
I can rearrange and show that as four pi squared over g times the slope. So now I need to calculate the slope. Slope is always rise over run. So if I use the two points that I've chosen and take a look at the difference in the y values, 22 minus 3, and divide that by the difference in the x values, 7 to 1, times the right exponent, uh, the right scientific notation, um, then I figure out that the slope is this 3.17 times 10 to the negative 16th. Again, for the units, just use the units that are on the, the graph. It's always y divided by x. So the units are second squared divided by meters cubed, right? Because it's the cube of the radius. Okay, so now I've already worked out my expressions to solve for the mass of Jupiter. So I see that the mass of Jupiter, according to this data, is 1.87 times 10 to the 27th kilograms, right? on the order of a thousand times larger than the Earth. Makes sense. Okay, another question, of, I think one of the, the final parts of this free response question, are to make a comparison. So we want to compare the forces between um, all three of these objects. So that it says that probe A and probe B are in these two different locations. So I made a quick sketch. Um, and I, I need to compare the forces, again, that any two of these objects have on each other and kind of rank these problems and then justify my ranking. Before you rank them, you probably want to have your justification first. So I look at the choices here. The force of the moon on A, the force of the moon on B, the force of probe A on the moon, uh, force of probe B on the moon, B on uh, A on B, and the force of B on A. Do any of those sound like action-reaction pairs? Well, they should. Some of them definitely are action-reaction pairs. Remember, we talked about this before. If you can just switch the nouns, you know you have an action-reaction pair. So the last two are definitely action reaction A on B, B on A. That's an action reaction pair. But so are some of the others. A choices A and C, the moon on A and A on the moon, that's an action reaction pair. And same with B on the moon and the moon on B. So we've got three action reaction pairs. And as always, action reaction pairs are equal to each other. Not that these three are equal to each other themselves, but they, within each pair, they're equal. So I know that some of them are going to be equal to each other, but which interaction is the greatest interaction? Well, we, I think the smallest is the easiest one to decide first. The objects with the smallest mass uh, react, interact the least with each other. So A on B or B on A, that's much smaller than the moon on either of those objects. So <clears throat> E and F are certainly the smallest of the forces. How about between the moon and B and the moon and A? What's the difference? Well, the moon's one object in both cases, and the second object in both cases has the same mass. So really, this is just looking at the distance. And since B is closer to the moon than A is, that has to be the larger interaction. So now we know that the moon on B is the greatest. The force of A on B is the least. And the force of moon on A is second. And we know that the rest are action-reaction pairs. And so they're equal. OK, so that was a long free response question. Hopefully, these ideas make sense. Here are some of the key takeaways for this unit. An object that moves at steady, speed, at steady speed in a circular path always has centripetal acceleration because the velocity is changing direction and acceleration is based on the velocity changing. For uniform circular motion, that net force is always towards the center of the circle. We still use Newton's second law, F equals MA holds, whether it's linear motion 
or centripetal acceleration in order to determine what the net force is, draw a free body diagram. We use Newton's law of gravitation in two different ways. First is to find the gravitational force between any two objects, or we can use it to help determine the gravitational field between any object or the gravitational field at any distance from an object's center. Those are the key points. Hopefully this all made sense. Um, and I'm going to take a break for the next unit. My friend, Miss GV, will be introducing unit four to you, and then I'll be back with unit five next week. Everybody take care. <laughs>